Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Futurist Society. I'm your host, Dr. Awesome. And as always, we are going to be talking in the present, but talking about the future. And today we have two awesome guests. We have Diana Azam and Jim Foote, both co-founders of First Ascent. We are doing some really amazing things with cancer therapies. Diana is an assistant professor at FIU, and she's also having a, a doctorate in biochemistry. Is that correct? Or right. yep, okay. And yeah. Jim Foote is a CEO and knows all things about the biotech industry and has helped bring a really significant therapy to market, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to speak with them. So, for those of you guys who aren't familiar, that one of their research articles was recently published in Nature, which is a really big impact factor journal. And I really think it's cool what they're doing. So tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing, Jim, as well as how it's going to help patients in the future. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. What we were able to demonstrate and publish in Nature Medicine is that by combining biology and technology, um, we were able to produce a platform that benefited patients 83% better with uh, refractory cancer. So their cancers come back and they benefited 83% better than had they just stuck with the standard of care and doctor's choice. Yeah, Diana, tell us a little bit about the science behind it because it's very easy to say that the therapy was effective, but how is this different from existing therapies that are on the market? So absolutely everybody knows that precision medicine is commonly uh, used to find the right drug for the right patient at the right time. This is used for cancer patients, but what's commonly used today is using DNA-only testing and trying to look for a drug that works for every patient. But what we've added here is this drug testing component where we can test hundreds of drugs directly on the patient's own living cancer cells and identify the right treatments for each individual patient, especially those patients that have exhausted standard of care. The idea of repurposing FDA-approved drugs to identify what works for each patient is really the foundation of the science behind the platform. Okay. So, you know, I don't have as much experience with cancer as more run-of-the-mill type of infections and things like that. And for those type of pathologies, I feel like it's very much one size fits all. You throw this antibiotic on it. Maybe you might tailor that once you get an antibiotic susceptibility test back based on the bacteria that have been growing in like an infection. Um, That's how is exactly it different? right. That's yeah. the right analogy. You you got it right. It's you, how, is it, yeah. how is it different with, with cancer though? Because you know not everybody knows what precision medicine is. And I think that you're probably at the cutting edge of this biotech industry, but for a lay person, what would they be looking for to be asking their doctor if they had some cancer that they wanted to to have this therapy and, and make sure that it's it's available to them as well? Well, no, I was going to say, you know, you really touch on something that's important. Most people think that when they're diagnosed with cancer, the doctor comes up with an individualized treatment plan based on the biology and the genomics of their individual cancer. What they don't realize is that cancer is basically treated based on the standard of care. It's mm -hmm. a recipe book that, that was established, you know, sometimes decades ago mm -hmm. and that they modified and adapted over time. But if you look at the three of us on this call, we are biologically different. We have different genders. We also have different national backgrounds, right? We're different, you know, nationalities. Mm -hmm. But if we all got the same cancer, we would all be treated exactly the same way, with the exception of it would vary a little bit based on our, our age and our weight. And what we've done is we've absolutely turned that model upside down and said, you know, while that's worked and it's worked for, you know, decades, the reality is one in three cancer patients still die in 2024 
over 33% of the cancer patients diagnosed with cancer will die. So yeah. if all three of us got it, one of us wouldn't be here tomorrow. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've said, let's base it on your biology. We take a biopsy of your tumor. We figure out what drugs work for you. We analyze it with AI. We come back with a personalized cancer treatment plan in about 10 days. And like Deanna said, it is about the right patient with the right drug at the right time. Yeah. So I I actually spoke with someone who is in the biotech space a, a little while back, and they were saying that precision medicine, the turnaround time can be weeks to months, right? And yeah. I think one of the things that I saw in your study that was published in Nature was that you have a much shorter turnaround time, correct? Yes. Exactly. And that's yeah. very important, especially when physicians or the doctors want to make a decision on the next treatment for the patient. Uh, and these patients are already progressive, which means they've gone through many lines of treatment. They don't have any more options. So time is of essence. They have to make a decision quickly. So by getting a biopsy and testing hundreds of drugs and giving results back quickly to the doctors, that really helps changing the course of treatment for that patient quickly. And that's important when we're dealing with patients that have exhausted uh, the standard of care. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's about sending things back in a clinically actionable time frame, And that's really important part. We know that mortalities go up by 10% for every 30 days you delay treatment. And so it's, it's absolutely important for us to return results in a clinically actionable time frame, And that's part of what we publish. And when cats yeah. come back, it's just, it gets more difficult to treat that obviously. And that's why when, you know, after patients have gone through many, many different treatments and their cancer returns, what we need to do is to be able to provide quick treatment uh, options for those patients uh, because it's not the first time or the second time, it's after many lines of treatment. Yeah. So personal story, both my parents passed from cancer and they were refractory cases that were enrolled in clinical trials and it was not the best experience. And certainly it ended in a poor outcome. What I mean, an inevitable outcome, which was them passing away. But that being said, I think going into this, there was so much hope for immunotherapy. There was so much hope for like genetics. Like have we really moved the ball forward with cancer treatment? You know, you're, you're saying, Jim, that a third of all people have passed away. Is that getting better? Or is that, you know, at least in your eyes, getting closer to being better? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, when you look at genomics, and, and again, th this is why, Dr. Awesome, we're so excited about our results. Because when you look at genomics, genomics actually help move the needle forward. You know, when you do DNA and RNA sequencing, find a biomarker and try to map a drug to that biomarker that ultimately treats the patient, what we were able to show in our study is that patients benefit 10% of the time, right? They move the needle forward 10%. But what we were also able to demonstrate is that when you combine functional drug testing, like we do with genomics, that the, the patients benefit almost 60% of the time. And, and so, you know, while the genome was mapped 20 years ago, we really believe that functional precision medicine approach is that next quantum leap forward. And, mm -hmm. and, and again, patients will, will benefit from that. That's what we were able to demonstrate in our study. I want to add that, you know, there, the other aspect, like you mentioned, there's so many drugs approved now by the FDA that are promising immunotherapy, and we have over 200 drugs approved by the FDA for treating cancer. What we're saying is, yes, these, all these drugs are there, they're available. Can we use these drugs in different indications, especially when patients run out of options? And this whole idea of repurposing these drugs when patients run out of options is very promising. There's always going to be options. And hopefully our platform will consistently provide physicians options for their patients. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's interesting that all of the things that you've mentioned, Dr. Awesome, because, you know, that's really it is everybody's looking for the silver bullet. Oh, it's in immunotherapy or it's in the organoid or the answer is in this silver bullet. And what we've really said is, yes, that may be, but it's about using the right bullet, right? You know, we have enough drugs, they're just not being used in the right way. So example would be, you know, it's called off-label use. So part of what our platform can identify is, say, for example, you had leukemia. 
Well, what we can find is a drug that's specifically for you and very effective against your leukemia. And perhaps that's a lymphoma drug, the ability to test hundreds of FDA approved drugs. These are drugs that the oncologists are already familiar with, but they wouldn't ever think about using a lymphoma drug on a leukemia. But when they see the data, why the drug works and they see the underlying mechanisms of why that drug's working, they're like, oh my gosh, I would have never thought about that. And that's really the power of bringing biology and technology together. It's, it's providing the data in a way that a doctor can make better decisions about your, your treatment options. We've had patients that respond to non-cancer drugs. And, mm. you know, like we had osteosarcoma patient that responded to an allergy medication. Right. So these non-cancer drugs, there is evidence that they can be effective in treating cancer. Our test gives that evidence and that data to the physician. Say, okay, maybe we can have a combination of an allergy medication with chemotherapy. And that's what we show in our study, is that when that happens, patients respond. When you say respond, I think what you had mentioned in the study was that it was like the extension of life for people that had tried everything, right? Which, you know, having been in that situation, I can tell you firsthand, like that is something that is of value, you know, to have a year with my parents versus six months with my parents is very valuable, right? And so I get that. That being said, I was just kind of wondering how... How do we know that that's correlation, or not causation, or causation, not correlation? You know, how do we know that those people might not have survived longer? I know you had compared in the study to like average numbers, um, but just from a layperson's perspective, how would it be quantifiable for them to understand that, like, okay, I am getting more life back with my family member as opposed to not? Again, remember, this was a feasibility study. It's how you design the study. Obviously, mm -hmm. you have certain standards of how to quantify the data. Because mm -hmm. this, the way we did this was the main question in that study, which is a feasibility study, can this be done? Can we take cells from a patient, add drugs in the lab, give results back to the doctor quickly to make decisions on the next line of treatment? That was really our first question. And we yeah. showed our study that, yes, it's feasible. It's resource intensive. It's a lot of work, but it can be done. Now, obviously, when we compare, then we started comparing outcomes of patients guided by our platform versus those that were not guided. And we see improvements in mm -hmm. patients' outcomes. But if you really want to remove completely all bias, right? And that's going to be the next way of we, our next clinical trial where we have a randomized two arms, no bias, and then we compare outcomes of patients guided by our platform versus patients that were not. So there's more studies and more clinical trials that need to still be done on larger number of patients. But we believe our study is still very important because not only we show it can be done, but the fact that we see improvement on patients, like you said, that are already exhausted and very advanced, that alone is promising. Because we compared each patient to their own previous regimen. We started looking at how patients did versus how they did in their previous regimen. And mm -hmm. we found improvement when we know when cancer returns, it's worse. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing an improvement in that it, when you're comparing it to their own previous regimen. And that's, that's why it's promising. But obviously, you still need to do more uh, clinical studies. But I think that's, you know, again, Deanna touched on something. We'll use, you know, again, we'll use uh, EV9 as an example. You know, this was an osteosarcoma patient. Uh, she had failed three lines of treatment. She tumor had uh, returned and aggressively growing. She had metastasis to, I believe, the spine and the lungs, and they've exhausted basically every standard of care. Mm -hmm. And what we found was idorubicin, which is a traditional chemotherapy, and monoleucus, which is an antihistamine. Mm -hmm. And those two drugs combined, she had complete response. The tumor went completely away. She ultimately died 84 weeks later. She got a year and a half of, of additional life, another birthday, another Christmas, you know, like you said, mm -hmm. died of sepsis. She didn't die of cancer, mm -hmm. and, and, but her immune system was so beat up that by the time we got to her, 
you know, she died of sepsis. So that's an example, though, of exactly the power of the platform. And I know you don't, you may not know a lot about osteosarcoma, but it's a very progressive disease. We have osteosarcoma in the head and neck. Yeah. I'm at least familiar with that aspect of it. And it is something that is a terrible disease. I guess my question is that, you know, life extension, which is something that had been highlighted and maybe I had not been reading it to the level that I needed to, maybe I wasn't understanding it as much as I would understand like a randomized clinical trial, because this was a very early stage study. And so for me to parse out what was important, yeah. I think was a little bit more difficult than on something that is more late stage, which I think is very much more evident, you know, because I deal with like having to look at the end stage studies so that I can modify my own practice. And it's very rare that I actually look at, you know, these feasibility studies that show me what's coming down the pipeline, right? I think someone like Diana is probably reading those because you need to be keeping up on the cutting edge technology that's out there. But as a practicing physician, like I'm not going to that literature, I'm more going into like the clinically relevant literature. And that's what I really want to know from you guys is just the clinical relevance, because I think that's what patients want to know about. They want to know, is this going to help me? What does this mean for me? Because everyone is also worried about, I can tell you, having treated cancer patients, everyone is also worried about the treatment being worse than, uh, or the cure being worse than the disease, right? Which is something that, especially with chemotherapy, you get. Like, I remember when my dad had metastatic melanoma, they put him on interferon therapy. He was a oh. totally different person. Yeah. Cool. Right? He had memory lapses, mood swings, and then he got off the therapy and he was back to normal again, right? But who knows if it worked, but we tried it because we're like any other person in that position going to throw the kitchen sink at this thing. So yeah. that's what we do. We get rid of yeah. the trial and error with our platform. And yeah. Yeah. the clinical data that we're showing is that first we get rid of you know unnecessary treatments that if we don't find those working on the cells in the lab, those mm. will not work on, on the patient's body. So we're getting rid of treatments that, you know, may be toxic and unnecessary. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really important. One of our patients had leukemia. And one thing that our platform was able to provide is safer options. So, you know, in children, they believe, the, you know, the more drugs, the better. This whole notion that, you know, three, four drugs are better than, you know, two. And what we're finding is that, no, two were as effective as three drugs. So we were able mm -hmm. to get rid of this drug that's toxic to the heart and yeah. still have an effect on killing the cancer cells in 30 days compared to 150 days in his previous regimen. And now he's in remission over two years. So That's exactly great. what you're saying. This is the data that physicians should look at. What I mentioned about randomized clinical trials is more large-scale efficacy data. But if you look at our clinical study today, as a treating oncologist, I can see that I can use this tool to help me make better informed decisions for my patients, especially those that don't have any more options. That's mm. what we're showing. Yeah. Us. And, and what we actually showed in our study was that the microenvironment that we create based on the technology that Diana's invented and how the body actually responds to the drug, there, there's a, what, a 98% correlation. And mm. so, you know, the, uh, to your point, we're not inventing a new drug. We're, we're not doing anything that, that the doctors are unfamiliar with. Um, so there, what we're actually doing is de-risking it. We're saying, mm -hmm. here's the drugs that are going to work on you. But by the way, those drugs may be different than what would work on Diana or on me. But here's the precise drugs that will work on you. And here's why. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what really makes us different than anybody else is because we can provide that level of, of detail that, you know, being specific and not rely on just you know, this grasping at straws to try to find the right drug or drug combination that will work. Yeah, let me ask you a question about that because I think that I feel like I understand the efficacy now. And I think that after hearing you guys speak, anybody would. Let's talk a little bit about the treatment. So from my understanding, you take a biopsy, you're able to either regrow the cells or create some sort of environment where you can actually test that sample of cancer with a whole panel of different drugs that are available. How is that even possible? How can you replicate the body's environment to a 98% correlation just out of 
curiosity. We don't need to get an intellectual no, no, no. property or I, anything I, like that. But I like to be asked this question because there's, you know, the idea of testing drugs on tumor cells is not new. This, I mean, anybody can think about it. It's a very simple idea. And it started off years ago, decades ago. But then the data that we generated was based on primitive assays. We've made so much advancements in the way we culture tumor cells in the lab today and advancements in how we dispense drugs. The technologies today are completely different than what we had 10 years ago. So mm. this is why when we get the biopsy in the lab, what we do is we don't grow the cells for a long term. We get them the way they are, mush them up a little bit, and then we keep everything in there. And what we show in our study is we had tumor cells, we had immune cells, we had stromal cells, all the mixed cell composition that's usually available in a tumor. Obviously, we can make it better and better, but based on just doing that quickly and adding and dispensing 100 drugs each at 10 different doses within a day, that we couldn't do years ago, and today we can. So all these advancements in technologies enables us to get those results quickly and give that data to doctors, which we couldn't do a decade ago. And this is why today the data that's coming out of this simple idea is much more powerful. And that's what I try, you know, we try to explain. I mean, I, I'm a member of the Society for Functional Precision Medicine, which is a relatively new society, but really our mission is to bring awareness and try to bring these functional assays as tools back to the clinic and let doctors know and treating physicians know that these technologies have advanced so much that you should start using them as tools for clinical decision-making. Yeah, and I think that here's the important part is, you know, Deanna said it, what we're doing was not possible 10 years ago. With the robot and the equipment that we have, it used to take a scientist five hours to do what Deanna's talking about. Now the robot does it in five minutes. Through you sound. Know. Sorry, yeah. I just thought, now we have technologies that dispense drugs through sound. Yeah, and that's how we can go down to nanoliters of drugs. To, so that's, that, sorry, I just wanted to, to add that. Yeah. No, no that's exactly. interesting. I didn't know that drugs could be dispensed by a sound so futuristic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, I'm, that's what I love and talking see, about. So I'm glad sound. that you added that. But not just with sound, but very precise amounts of, of drugs. And again, that's what allows us to get the fidelity in helping treat these patients because we're using all of these advanced technologies. You look at AI. AI is finally, after decades, beginning to deliver against all of the promises that it's made. And the cost of computing's come down. And all of this time, we've been testing and validating and publishing. And mm -hmm. it, it really feels like the technology, the industry, everything's kind of come together at the same time to make this available on a broader scale to virtually every cancer patient who fails the standard of care. Right so now, tell, we can tell me a little bit about the market forces that are at work behind the scenes, right? Because I, I feel like you guys are both in the biotech industry and you have an insight into this that I don't have. Yeah. You have a breakthrough like this, right? And you realize that there's some value in it. You put a paper out that is in one of the most high impact journals. It was the on the cover of this journal. Yep. Um, what is it like actually bringing a product to market? Is that something that is going to be like a decade from now? Like, I don't think that I, I know enough about the biotech industry because on the one hand, you have the vaccines came out for COVID yep. within a few months. And then, you know, you have other drugs. Like I, there's a particular bone grafting substitute that I have been looking at for years and I'm yep. waiting until it's available, but it's still not available to me. Right. So if I'm a patient and I'm suffering through this, I would probably want to know what is the timeline? Where can I get access to this kind of stuff? Yeah. Great question. I, I call them gatekeepers. There's so many gatekeepers in this ecosystem. Ultimately, the patient has to decide, I, I want a better chance at my survival. You know, mm -hmm. under right to try, which was passed in 2018, if you fail the standard of care, you as a patient have the right to try whatever means you need to save your own life, provided you can support a claim of efficacy. And that's really where we come in. But so patients are one of the gatekeepers. Doctors, believe it or not, are one of the gatekeepers. Yeah. And then ultimately, insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies is- Oh, they're having, definitely gatekeepers. They're, they're, gatekeepers the bane, right? they're the bane of my existence. Let's just take them off the table. Yeah. But I do want to talk about how are doctors 
gatekeepers. Is there still a dogma of using protocols that, yeah. you know, when I think about oncology, I think about, okay, this person has X, I need to look at protocol Y, and then that's how we treat them, right? And then yeah. after the treatment fails, then we start going into different stuff, right? Yeah. Which is um, something that I feel like realistically has benefits to it. I, I think that there are benefits to trying the more study the stuff first. Yeah. Uh, if somebody goes through, let's say, two rounds of standard protocol, having been in that situation myself, the doctors were coming to us and saying, like, let's try this clinical trial. Let's try this. Let's try that. What is, what is your guys' experience? Because I just genuinely want to know about it. Yeah, no. Yeah, great question. And you know, I'll start out, and then I'll let Deanna fill in, is we actually... You know, if you look at the Gartner innovation curve, right? I don't know if you're familiar with that, but there are early adopters, early, early majority, majority, late majority, late adopters, right? So what we find is it's a mixed bag. You know, doctors are naturally skeptical. They're skeptical by design. You go to medical school, and I think one of the things that they teach you is be skeptical. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so. There is a lot of companies out there that are making all of the same claims that we've made but they're missing one thing, the clinical evidence. They've done retrospective studies. They've looked at data and retrospectively, ours is prospective. And so doctors are naturally skeptical. When they see what we're able to do and they see how the patients respond and they see the insights that we're able to give them quickly, they instantly get on board. And so if you look at our two clinical studies that we're running out of Nicholas Children's Hospital in Cleveland Clinic, Florida, We've absolutely been overrun with patients because the doctors are sending us more patients than we have the capabilities of handle. And so that's really it is if we just focus on those early adopters, again, that still represents probably far more patients than our company can even handle for the next year. 609,000 cancer patients die every year in America, 609,000. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 15,000 patients is only 1.7% of the total population that will die next year. And if we can support them, we can help a lot of patients and, and really unlock a lot of value for our company. So, you know, you asked another question, you know, if I'm a patient, when's this going to be ready? So right now we're going through CLIUS validation at the FIU lab. Once that lab is CLIA validated, that gives us the freedom to help patients outside of a clinical study. So that means if I got cancer tomorrow and we have that CLIA validation, a patient can come to me and say, I need help. And we can be able to help them, you know, collaborating with the lab. And so we're targeting July. But one of our challenges has been is because of the success of our clinical study, patient care comes first. We've actually had to delay some of the validation because we've been overrun with patients. So I'll pause there. And Dion, if you want to add anything, feel free. I, I think you covered everything. I think it really, it's all about the early adopters. That's been my experience with early adopter physicians. And when they start using this tool, and there's a lot of between, you know, me and the doctor. And that's important. Scientists, basically scientists and the doctor. So we have a fine needle biopsy, right? Get it from a patient. It's a small biopsy, but we can still test 50 drugs. So we go back to the physician. What are your thoughts? What are you thinking? What do you want to test? And it's become a very dynamic experience where we would get physician feedback and we would start testing drugs that doctors are thinking about. And then we tell the doctor, you know what, out of these 50 options, those are the best. And that mm -hmm. has gotten more and more physicians to start adopting this approach is that, you know, interaction that takes place in real time. And so I believe as we do this and we continue to do this, we'll be able to convince more doctors to use these tools and technologies to, to inform, you know, clinical decisions. I, I, I have a lot of friends who are oncologists and everybody has that skepticism that you were talking about, Jim. I think that everyone ha it's, it waits for someone that they respect to do mm -hmm. something before they're willing to jump on board, at least. I can say that from even my own personal experience. I'm not going to jump into a new, new surgical treatment without somebody that I respect, at least giving me their experience and, and it being a positive one. That being said, if you guys get your certification, 
and an oncologist wants to start using your treatment, then they just contact you and, or, or is the patient that contacts you? Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. So it's basically the patient or the doctor can contact us directly. We send them a kit because the kit has to be prepared in a very special way to allow us to achieve the results. We have to get a fresh biopsy within 24 to 48 hours. The beauty of what we're able to do, and in fact, we just got a, a grant to close health disparities in minority communities because what we're able to do is the patient doesn't have to travel to a cancer hub. They can mm -hmm. be treated locally in their local hospital by their local doctor, but they can have this world-class protocol precisely telling them what drugs to use. But it's just as simple as they'd contact us. We would send them a kit. We have a patient care coordinator who would work with the surgeon and the hospital to make sure that we get the biopsy appropriately shipped to us. And the rest is ours. What is the turnaround time for results? 10 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. Faster that's, than my biopsies come back. That's right. Yeah. And that's, you know, again, it has to be done in a clinically actionable time frame. That's great, man. Well, I'm, you know, listen, all the best of luck to you guys. And it is something that I'm personally keeping an eye on because I have a vested interest in it just from my history that I kind of shared with everyone. I wanted to ask just about any more evidence because I know that we had talked before we started about other preliminary results that you guys were having. Is there anything that is available for people who are in maybe their first stage of cancer therapy? Because I can just tell you from my experience with head and neck cancer, right now, for whatever reason, head and neck cancer is on the rise yeah. and it's getting more aggressive. It's especially hitting younger populations, the HPV yeah. associated head and neck cancer. And the 33 year old patient that comes in to see me, does he have to go through failed treatment first beforehand? Is there any value for him to do this test up front? I'm just not sure about any sort of opportunity that's available for patients that have really aggressive disease yeah. that you want to throw the kitchen sink at them yeah. right off. I mean, I'll take a first stab at this, and this is going to be a little bit different than probably what the is going to answer is. So under the clinical studies, the study design has been written for patients whose cancers return. From our perspective, from a first descent perspective, outside of a clinical study, if you know, this is where the patient, the doctor, and first descent all come in together. And if we have a doctor who ultimately is going to have to make that decision, do I treat based on standard of care? Do I treat based on this protocol? That's the decision the doctor has to make. We can provide them all of the evidence. And if we have doctors that are interested and patients that are willing to do this, as a first line of treatment, I don't think there are any barriers to keep us from doing that except lawyers. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I'm going to just add that our goal and yep. you know, my personal scientific goal is to set up clinical trials for patients that are newly diagnosed. Because I truly believe, based on the data that we're seeing, is that if we start early, we will really prevent um, yeah. a lot of toxic effects of the trial and errors that come with drugs that are not going to work. And the earlier we start, the more effective this is going to be. And I, I believe that we will show it. That's our goal. We're going to get grants to fund clinical trials on newly diagnosed cancer patients. But let's say had a neck, osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma all these types yeah. of cancers that are just brutal in terms of their treatment. And yeah. mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the data. I mean, one of the things we are, I'm sorry to hear about your parents. I lost a son to cancer. Oh my gosh. And that was really the genesis behind me saying, I know this is a solvable problem. Yeah. And yeah. Nothing's worse than taking a kid through eight months of grueling chemotherapy uh -huh. and amputating a leg and calling it uh -huh. limb salvage only to have their cancer come back and ultimately take their life. And so Deanna mentioned a, you know, we want to fund a, a osteosarcoma study. Because we really believe that that's a really brutal disease. And we really believe that ultimately we can help change the standard of care. By the way, that hasn't changed in 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what we're trying to do. We also have a pancreatic cancer study because, again, pancreatic cancer is just really a difficult one to treat. Mm -hmm. And the patients are getting younger. 
So we're working with it, believe it or not, a healthcare system, an insurance company. We talked about the gatekeepers that they want to sponsor a health economic study because what we were able to show was that with the patients that we treated, a number of them, not only did they have better outcomes, but we significantly reduced the cost. Hmm. Interesting. Cheaper yeah, drugs, I mean, more I, accessible drugs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I look forward to that data coming out and uh, certainly any head and neck cancer oriented data, you guys can feel free to send my way and I'll try to disseminate it. It's just such a tough thing to talk about because it touches everybody's lives. I, does. I can only imagine what you've been through, Jim. I feel like there's some solace in watching your parents pass away, but man, just watching a kid pass away, that's on yeah. another level, right? It should be the other way around. It should be the other um, way around. But yeah. I hate to end on such a sad note. I really appreciate what you guys are doing, but we are getting close to the end of our time. Yeah. I always end with three questions that I ask all of my guests, which are supposed to inspire a lot of hope and hopefully kind of make sure that we think about the future in an optimistic light. The idea of making the future, building the future, just like what you guys are talking about, really comes from inspiration. And I always ask all my guests, what is your inspiration? I'm sure that Jim would say that his experience with his son is probably his. But Diana, I didn't get to ask you. I, I'm, I'm sure that there's some pretty interesting stories behind why you do what you do. We're all touched by cancer, but thankfully, I know my family was touched by cancer. What inspired me was, as a scientist, I realized we, we make all these amazing state-of-the-art discoveries in the lab. But when I looked at how many of these are available for treatments on cancer patients, I realized that very few are. And that's where I was like, okay, no, this is crazy. We're, we're making great discoveries in the lab that don't really get to patients. And that's what inspires me. I want to be able to be part of that mission. My mission is to try to work on bringing these state-of-the-art technologies to patients. That's crazy, crazy what the disconnect is. Like, there's two things that I wish that people knew about from this podcast. What I wish that the layperson would know is number one, that there's other than the standard protocol that there's other treatment options and those that number other is probably at least dozens most likely hundreds right i i don't think a lot of people realize just the amount of drugs that have been researched out there right. that aren't even used for anything or they might be used for something else and so or the, they're that's or they're right. orphan drugs right. exactly yeah or they're orphan drugs and and even the idea like where you were talking about genomics right i mean we're curing sickle cell these days there's lots of treatment options that are even just outside of drugs that might be effective but we don't have a way of quantifying that and i appreciate the fact that that you guys are doing that that being said i don't think the general public knows that there's more treatment options than the first treatment option that's available to them and the second thing that i don't think that they know about is that everybody talks about precision medicine. Everybody thinks that we're in the future because we have iPhones in our hands and WebMD is able to give them a, a full detailed rundown of exactly what's specific for them. That being said, most people are treated by a standard protocol. And the, the benefit of that is the safety, right? Like they've, this is something that's tried and true. It's been used. It's shown effectiveness. But I think that everybody thinks that they have a doctor who's looking specifically at their genetic structure and their physiology and they're getting a treatment that's specific for them and that's just not the case and that's certainly an inspiration because you've seen a need and now you're trying to fix that problem that you see so i really appreciate that second question that i ask everybody is where do you see biotech and specifically your field in 10 years i've had people on about ai i've had people on about robots i've had people on about space exploration but biotech specifically is important to me because I live just a few blocks from MIT. You can see the yep. picture of it behind us. And that's the biotech capital of the world. So where do you guys see it? Because you're actually in the trenches. You're in the arena doing this stuff to make the world better. How do you see biotech in 10 years? I'll start with you, Jim. Yeah, I think the biotech industry is one of the last industries that's ready for digital disruption. Mm -hmm. um, so I think doctors know it. The FDA knows it. The patients know it. And it's just really a matter of how do we get there? I believe that technology will enable doctors to make better decisions by assimilating petabytes of information and clinical data and functional drug testing and all of that and putting it in their hands so that they can make better decisions. I hope we never get to the point where, you know, 
AI or, or some technology is making the decision for a doctor. Mm. I always want you to make decisions about me, but mm. I want to be able to put as much data in your hands so that you can take all of your knowledge and all of your experience and you can read that data and you can take action on it. So that's where I see it going. Diana, where do you see biotech in 10 years? I would add that with the AI, so now that the way we're doing this, we're integrating AI. So think about the data set that's being generated over time. You're talking from every cancer patient, we're going to know your genomics, your yeah. RNA sequencing, drug response, and then put all that data into an, an AI engine. So what I feel like in five, 10 years, we may not even need a biopsy to predict right. this AI engine based on your sequence, based on your biology, will predict the mm. right treatments for each patient. So that's where I see it. I believe that will really Trans transform the way we manage cancer. Yeah. Um, we're building a data set that does not exist mm -hmm. because it's going to have genomics data, but it's going to have hundreds of drugs tested against a biologically diverse patient population. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And then adaptive AI will allow us to use all of that history in situations where we can't get a biopsy and make a better prediction on how that patient should be treated so that the doctor can look at that data and make those decisions faster. Interesting. Can I give you my idea of where I hope the industry goes and Absolutely. you guys tell me if it's realistic? Please. And this is a, speaking as a surgeon, so there's a certain amount of self-loathing that's associated with this question, but I would love to be in a situation where we don't need to operate on people anymore. Right. What really blew my mind was when they cured sickle cell. If we can do that, the possibilities are endless, right? Yeah. Surgery to me is such an elegant thing, but it's also a very brutal thing. Yeah. And yeah. you know what I'm talking about, Jim, the, the recovery is tough. And I just feel like maybe I'm naive, but we have so much more understanding now than we did even when my parents were alive. And I, I feel like we're on the cusp of something. And I don't know what that is. And that's why I like to talk to people like you that, yeah. that kind of give me some insight. But is that unrealistic? Am I, is, are no. we talking like 50 years before that happens? No, no. I think it's sooner than that. I really do think it's sooner than that. And, and again, like Deanna said, we may never eliminate the need to do a surgery, but if we can do it in as least invasive of a way, a mm -hmm. fine needle biopsy to be able to allow us to recapitulate these cells to the point that then we can, with a high degree of precision, come up with the right drugs for the right patient at the right time without having to go in and do a, a big biopsy or a limb salvage or, or something very invasive. I think ultimately that's that next stepping stone. Mm -hmm. What about you, Diana? We have robotics right now. That I think you're right. Maybe we will be able to get robotics that will replace... Yeah, I don't know about that. I think I'm better than a robot right now, but I don't know if that's the ego talking. I hope that we we do have better outcomes through robotics, but the, the, I can tell you firsthand the technology isn't there for that right now, and it's going to be a while for that to happen. But you know, that being said, I, I did want to talk about something that is very similar to what you're saying. My last question always is, what are you guys interested in outside of your own particular field? Like, what there's so many different technological revolutions that are happening in the midst of what's happening in biotech. I am so fascinated by them. I cannot wait until I have a helper robot that's able to do my dishes and fold my laundry. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna be the first person in line for that robot. Uh, so anytime I see like Atlas robot or Boston Dynamics is uh, a few cities away, I, I take a look at what they have to offer, just you know, my own personal interest and, and no financial interest whatsoever. But what about you guys? Cause you know, you're in a very, cutting edge, technology driven field, you're building the future. What other aspects of the future are you excited about? And I'll start with you again, Jim. I was going to say, have Diana go first. Okay. You know, Diana, I, you go I, first. You think about your answer. No, I know my answer. Again, okay. No, if you don't go for it, because I have, you know, what is, is part of my DNA is solving complex problems. Mm. It, it really is. And so what gets me excited is Again, that, that juncture between biology and technology. So example, to be able to, to take a cadaver heart, flush it from the cells, you know, flush all the cells out of it, use it as a scaffolding, 3D print you know, living blood cells back into that heart, give it a spark and have it start uh, beating. I've seen that done. 
And wow. I, I met the woman who spent 25 years of her life doing that. But so you start thinking about that because again, if we start interstellar travel, we go to Mars, you can't do a heart transplant on Mars, but you can yeah. 3D print one. So I think that's, you know, these amazing people that are solving these complex problems that, that I, I think that's, that's the stuff that interests me. Oh my God. I can't beat that. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> I'm a scientist. Yeah. I go in every day and I, I think how realistic it is to solve a problem every day. So I, I really don't have anything that I thought about that. Yeah. No worries. To speak to what Jim was saying is just a few months ago, they actually transplanted a kidney from a pig devoid of all That's immune responding cells and markers and, and put it into a human being. Unfortunately, it did not go well for the patient. The patient has since passed away, but at least they're trying it, right? Like that didn't exist 30 years ago. The idea of building in the body is a very difficult thing. And so that's speaking from first experience. It's very easy to take things away. It's very easy to mimic other things or wrap things around so that it it is functional, but to build something, that's pretty cool. Well, listen, thank you guys. If I could add one more thing, I'm sorry, but you know, the other thing I think that's exciting is a lot of these innovations aren't coming from scientists like Diana. They're coming Mm -hmm. from technologists like me or Mm -hmm. others that bring an engineering background into biology. And it's really bringing those two things together. So a lot of that innovation is actually coming from outside of the sciences field, which I think is amazing because you're getting the best of both worlds. Well, I I think that to speak to what you said earlier about gatekeepers, there's a lot of gatekeepers in academic science. And and I'm sure that Diana will say that even just to get her PhD, there was probably so many things that she had to jump through to get that, right? That, that just, it starts you out at like a disadvantage, right? Like you're starting your true career in your forties and fifties, your true impact in your forties and fifties. Whereas like, you know, Industry is something totally different. Like a 20 year old can come up with like a revolutionary technology that changes the way that we live. Right. And that I think is really profound. And I'm excited about it. I think that the, that industry is where the impact factor is right now. And so kudos to you guys for, for taking the science and making something out of it. I don't think it's easy. And I know how long of a process it is by following some other therapies that I'm looking at. And so the fact that you guys actually got something to actually in patients' hands, it's able to help patients. Kudos to you guys. That being said, for anybody who is a cancer survivor or someone who is undergoing cancer themselves and wants to get in contact with First Ascent, we're going to have all that information here under the comments section. And so, you know, we'll hopefully get them to that next level where we're actually being able to predict and treat cancers in the first stage as opposed to in these later stages. So thank you guys for doing what you're doing. And thank you to everybody that's listening out there. Please like and subscribe as always. And for the people who are regularly listening, we will see you again in the future. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.